One of India's most prominent politicians says Britain should atone for plundering his country during colonial rule. Shashi Tharoor is the Congress Party MP and was in the running to be the United Nations Secretary General at the time Ban Ki Moon won the role. In his book Inglorious Empire, Shashi Tharoor argues that British rule in India was totally amoral and bent on the subjugation of Indians for the purpose of profit. He joined the world earlier. Good to be with you, Beverly. You have argued that the British Prime Minister should be on her knees begging for yeah. forgiveness <laughs> for the colonial period. That's not likely to happen. What do you think would be sufficient? What, what, what sort of gesture would be sufficient for you? Well, I do think an apology is due because there's a moral debt. I'm not asking for reparations in sort of the financial sense of the term. But, you know, Britain did come to one of the richest countries on earth and over 200 years of depredation, exploitation, um, neglect, uh, managed to reduce it to a poster child for third world poverty. When the British left in that first shambolic Brexit in 1947 with the partition of the subcontinent as a result of their divide and rule policy, and, 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 and we've managed to recover to a great extent from there, but that doesn't mean that a moral debt isn't owed. And I think that's why, I mean, I, actually, it's not so much the Prime Minister I'd like, I think a member of the royal family, because after all, everything was done in the name of the Crown. Mm -hmm. Somebody so should come and say, look, we're sorry. Uh, we've got a perfect occasion coming up. The Jallianwala Bagh massacre reaches its 100th birthday on the 13th of April 2019. One of the worst atrocities of the Raj, a betrayal of promises made in, in exchange for which India supported the First World War with men and material and lots of money. Um, the betrayal of those promises, the cruelty of the massacre of unarmed uh, men, women and children in this location in Amritsar, the Jalianwala Bagh, the racism that accompanied it, and then the self-justification. Money was raised to reward the general who ordered the massacre. Mm. And, uh, and Rudyard Kipling, that flatulent voice of Victorian imperialism, <laughs> called him the man who saved India. And after all of that, surely that would be the perfect occasion to say sorry. But of course it has been 70 years since partition and there have been mistakes made subsequently. What is the, what is the biggest legacy, what is the biggest obstacle do you think of British history that is that it stands in India's way? Well, it doesn't stand in India's way. I think it much more stands in Britain's own way, the historical amnesia uh, that goes on right now. You can actually do A-levels in history in the UK and not learn a line of colonial history. There are no uh, museums to the colonial experience. There's an Imperial War Museum. There's no colonialism museum. Uh, you can find a statue in the heart of London to the animals that served the Allies in the two wars, not one to the 1.3 million Indians who fought in the first World War or the 1.7 million who fought in the Second World War, many of whom gave their lives mm. in heroic circumstances for the cause. I think Britain really has to wake up and realise that they are where they are because we helped them to get there. And of course, India is galloping ahead right now in terms of its progress. <laughs> what it is still seen though as very bureaucratic, very corrupt. How do you rid it of that? Well, I mean, frankly, you know, I, I, I've, I've joked that uh, the British taught the Indian bureaucracy that anything resulting from the filling of forms <laughs> in quadruplicate <laughs> couldn't possibly be an injustice. So it's all English. And so, and so well, of course, <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, let's face it, the mm. British are the only people in history crass enough to make revolutionaries out of Americans so they could certainly make bureaucrats out of Indians. But jokes apart, I mean, the fact is that uh, we have our share of problems. We're tackling them, perhaps not well enough and not effectively enough. But given where we were in 1947, we've come a long way. I mean, literacy rate was 17 percent when the British left. It's now up to 79. That's still 21 percent of Indians who can't read and write, and that's 21 percent too many. But we've made progress. Life expectancy was 27. Now it's 69. So progress is being made despite the problem. You have had such deep experience also at the United Nations. Give me your thoughts on this North Korean crisis at the moment. Well, it's quite extraordinary. Isn't it? I mean, how, how does one predict the behaviour of someone, frankly, as irrational seeming as, as, as President Kim? I mean, it does look as if, um, as if he's saying to the world, pay attention to me, take me seriously. And maybe we'd better, because if indeed these missiles that have sailed over Japan were pulled back a bit shorter, we could have a first-class global crisis on our mm -hmm. hands. And I'm not sure there's any easy way to solve it. I think diplomacy uh, and 
reining him in is far more important, I think, than reacting to any damage he might actually do. And is it in any way helped by Donald Trump's rhetoric and bellicose statements? I don't think it helps at all, and I think that's one of the reasons why Mr Trump's advisers appear to have, have urged him to dial it back, and I think after that one statement he's been relatively quiet. Uh, we certainly can't afford to have two sets of irrational decisions on both sides. Uh, two sets of irresponsible statements are bad enough, but we don't want to provoke either one into doing something the world will not easily recover from. I'm fascinated by your opinion too on China's role in the region. Of course, India and China have been in a standoff on the dock on the border with Bhutan. India backed off a little and now things seem to have settled. How do you see China's role in the region, its expansionism? Is it concerning for India? It is. Well, I mean, you know, China's peaceful rise, as they called it, was fine with all of us. I think the entire region accommodated itself to that. I mean, China was this burgeoning economic power and it had a right to rise uh, in, in the interests of its own people. But it's when it began sort of moving its elbows a little too far in other people's faces. The Nine Dash Line in the South China Sea, for example, and now the border belligerence with India, then we begin to worry. You know, we, we do believe that China has plenty of room to grow and to flourish and that everyone wants to see it succeed because I think a lot of countries would like to prosper in its wake. Mm -hmm. But we don't want a new sort of 298-pound gorilla on this particular beach. That would not be healthy for the region. It would not be healthy for and the world. And under Xi Jinping, it does seem as if it's a little more agitated about its position in the world. It wants to cement its authority. Well, he is seen as the most powerful leader China's had in a very long time. Mm. And, of course, you've got the Party Congress coming up. Um, we were all worried as to how this would play out before the Party Congress, but it does seem that the standoff with the Indian troops in a place called Doklam in Bhutan mm. uh, has been eased now through an entirely diplomatically negotiated solution. And to my mind, that's a good sign. It suggests that China still does see that it's gained more out of being peaceful than it could out of being belligerent. We wish you well with your, 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 your battle with Britain. Lovely to speak to you, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> nice to see you. Take care.